Angelo Bruno was known as the Gentle John and ran the Philadelphia Mafia for many years before his brutal murder set in motion the most violent time in Philadelphia Mafia history. Hi everyone, thanks for stopping by our table of disappointment. This is How They Got Away, the show where we discuss the unsatisfying endings to your favorite unsolved or unpunished true crime and corporate grade stories. I'm your host today, Kelsey, with my co-host... Annalise, I am ready for Kelsey to start her mafia crime era. Today, we are going to learn about how one man's death would set in motion. Oh, no, I already said that. Uh, I would say our table is in a casino in Atlantic City. And if you look out the window that faces the alley at the right time, you might see a pair of men loading a suspiciously shaped bag into the trunk of a car. For those who don't know me, uh, in real life, I love the mafia <laughs> in like a bad way. We went on a whole ass tour in New York. We did. It was really fun. If you ever get the chance, it's so fun. This, oh, this was a great, this was great for me. I really got to dive into it. This, this story is less, it's technically unsolved. This, uh, this case is one of those that is technically unsolved and technically unpunished. But we have out on pretty good authority what happened here. And also, uh, people were definitely punished, but not in an official sense. I think sense. that's the case with a lot of mafia stories, is that they kind of take care of it in-house. Actually, that's exactly what happened here, is that people tried to take care of it in-house, but they didn't do it the right way. And that is such a... It's not fun, because it's bad, and it's terrible, and it's murder, but it's also, like, so fun. <laughs> so let's start with Angelo. Born Angelo Annaloro, May 21st, 1910, in Sicily, Italy, he would immigrate to the Americas with his brother Vito, and they would settle in southern Philadelphia. That's a pretty common area for Italian immigrants to settle that New York pretty often. Uh, his father was a foundry worker that would open a grocery store, and Angelo would help at that grocery store until he was 12. At which point he would enter school for the first time. This is the twen the 1910s, 1920s. School was not as standardized as it was today. So he went to school for the first time in 1922, but he would drop out a few years later. Not uncommon for the time, especially I was say, for sounds very normal for the time. Very normal for the time. He probably would have uh, dropped out right around when the crash started yeah. to hit. Uh, especially for blue collar immigrant you gotta workers, go help your family. not uncommon when you need to start getting a job. Yeah. To support the family. Eventually he would get to a point where he would open his own grocery store. So, you know, we're moving up in the world. We're a small business owner. Now he's working, he's managing, he's got some people underneath him. <laughs> exactly. In 1931. So he's 21 years old. He would marry his childhood sweetheart, Asunta Sue Maranaka. Oh, no, Maranka. That's my bad. And they would have two children together, Michael and Jean. Good old Michael and Jean. He really started to become a business. Like, he really made the American dream work for him. He started to get other business, like, buy other businesses. He owned an extermination company. He owned an aluminum products company. Can we say how much an exterminator company and, like, a grocery store sounds so mafia? Listen... My family is from is Italian immigrants on my mom's side. My one of my relatives works in uh, burning garbage to make energy. Yeah. No wonder you love the mafia, Kelsey. <laughs> Listen, all I'm saying is there were some certain family members we weren't allowed to associate with. That's all I'm saying. Uh, okay, where was I? Right, owned an aluminum pr products company owned a share in the Plaza Hotel in Havana, Cuba, and owned several legitimate businesses. So we haven't gotten into the crime part yet. Legitimate businesses. But also, if you're that prominent of a businessman in the Philadelphia area of this time, you kind of need to know some people, and especially if you're an Italian immigrant. There is a certain amount of connection you have with For the mafia sure. because this is kind of the only support system that italian immigrants had in america that actually gave a shit you had about so much them. against you at that time so like yeah you have legitimate businesses great for him like wonderful but you're probably also having to 
do some things in order to that, get that to happen. You're making connections and relationships with people in order yeah. to sustain that. So due to this, at a young age, Angela would end up joining the Philadelphia Mafia. He was, to be part of the Mafia, you have to be sponsored by somebody who's already a part of it. Sorry, how old was he again at this time? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what age, but it would have been like early to mid-20s. So he was sponsored by Michael Maggio, who is a convicted murderer and was known nationally at the time for that. He went, ah, yes, friend, sponsor me. You are well known. Uh, I don't know if it's a coincidence or not that uh, Angelo named his son Michael. I don't know if he named him after this person or not. Interesting, interesting. Weird, random question. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, of course, there has to be some kind of risk to sponsoring someone, right? Because you bring someone into the fold. So if they fuck up, it's on you, right? Yeah. If uh, you bring someone into the fold and they are underneath you, number one, I believe they have to pay you a cert. There's a lot of stuff about the mafia that's kind of like an MLM. They, like, have to pay you some sort of tribute, I believe, for a while. But also, like, if they screw up, you get punished as well. And at what point, like, you're initially sponsored to come in are you eventually certified to be like a member and you're no longer like your sponsor's responsibility? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So that's that's known as being made into the Got family. Got it. So at first you're brought into the family, but once you're made, you're your own entity within the family. It's like you it's like you married in and you're like kind of there, but then you actually become part of that family tree. Actually, you can marry into the mafia. <laughs> that is a way of being made. So goodbye, Anna Loro. That's a fine last name, but we're going to go with something a little cooler. We're going to go by Bruno. Bruno was... (laughs) We aren't talking about Bruno. (laughs) Bruno was his paternal grandmother's maiden name, so he did have some personal connection to the name. But also it's apparently an homage to Philadelphia gangster Giuseppe Joe Bruno Dovi. There's a lot of people you're going to you're going to recognize in here. There's a lot of folks that are well known okay, okay. for their time in the mafia. Uh there's also going to be a lot of people I'm going to say their name, but then in the middle of it there's a nickname. A lot of folks apparently there there are a million franks in this case. A million too many franks, franks. But they all have different a lot of franks, but they all have different nicknames. <laughs> One of them is just Alpha. No, it's understandable. It's like if you have a class with, like, several Noahs, you're going to call them something. I also believe that there was a certain amount of, like, obscuring who was involved in what. Because if I say, oh, you know, Michael Maggio is down at the docks today and anybody... Like a code name. The, like, cops pick up on that. Yeah, it's a code name. There's a little bit of, like... Who is Let's it? Let's obscure who this person who is because we protect our own. Mm-hmm. At the time, the Philadelphia Mafia was known for violent infighting, which led to several bloody street wars between rival factions within the family. But Angela was like, this is bad for the mob's bottom line. I mean, this is expensive. <laughs> he was a businessman. Man's a businessman. He's like, we... We can't afford all this infighting. We could be making the monies, but instead we're losing people to this stupid infighting. Angela Bruno himself had connections to the New York Gambino crime family. We're going to talk about the the Gambino family a little bit more as we get going here. He was roommates with the cousin of a mobster, John Simone. We're going to talk about John Simone later. And at that point, you are like, that's such a close relation. Yeah, it it is. That's how you get it. I feel it. like in the terms of like how people connect each other, you could be like eight things removed and you're still connected. This guy is two things removed. He's very connected. <laughs> yeah, he's in it. And the Gambino family in New York is not a small crime family. That is a major connection to have. The Gambino family was known for controlling violence through meetings and mediation, which is thought to have later influenced Angela's approach to organized crime. It's like, why are we fighting? We could have a meeting. Yeah, literally, let's have a good old fashioned sit down. This is that. It's like, okay, the two brothers are fighting. Sit your asses down. Let's talk about this. Let's have a conversation. So he would rise up the ranks and eventually would become the family leader in 1950. 
nine after succeeding Joseph Ida. He got so promoted. Now he, he's the Don. <laughs> he's the boss. And he's a, like, you don't get to be Don without getting your hands a little dirty. Kind of a bad guy. But he's not a bad guy, you know? He's a bad guy, but he's not a bad guy. <laughs> Bruno himself, uh, growing up in Southern Philadelphia, had lived through the gang violence in the streets. He knew what that looked like. He'd grown up in that area. So he wanted to avoid keeping this image for the Southern Philadelphia Mafia going. He wanted to change the Mafia's image, Good for essentially. Him. Making Good it for better him. from the inside. He Exactly. So to do this, he kind of wanted to avoid the eyes of the media and law enforcement alike. So instead of having these really public, violent outbursts in the streets with within the family, with other crime families, they try to handle their issues a little bit more privately, a little more quietly. And this is really interesting because this is the exact opposite of what the crime family had looked like before Bruno came to power. Bruno preferred bribery and soft power rather than straight up murder or shows of force. That's not to say he was afraid to use those when they were called for, but he would prefer to he avoid them if skills. possible. On his resume, soft skills. He did. He truly had people skills. Communication, mediation rather than violence. <laughs> so he started to run the mob like it was a legitimate business, you know, looking at the bottom line, looking into deals he could make with people how to make you know why make, why go the hard way when you can go the easy way why murder six people when bribing one will do and also like you strengthen relationships that way you burn a lot of bridges when you kill someone exactly this earned him the reputation of the the gentle or the docile don that was kind of his title as a don he also he at one point would banish a violent soldier, Nicodemo, Little Nicky Scarfo. We're going to talk about him later, too. A lot of these players, they'll come back. And he banished them to the then backwater Atlantic City, New Jersey, after he was charged with manslaughter. Atlantic City, before it really became this big gambling capital, was kind of a small potatoes place. And he banished him there because he was like, you're causing problems. You're too violent. You're a loose cannon. You know, we can't have this. Other Dons might have simply gotten rid of Little Nicky, you know, sleeping with the fishes after he had become a problem. But Bruno, he might have disapproved of Little Nicky's use of violence. But again, Bruno's like, he can still have his uses. He needs rehab before we bring him back into the fold, but we're not going to cut him loose. <laughs> You're still good for the family. Bruno was considered a pillar of his home community in Southern Philadelphia because, again, the mafia is known for its violence and its crimes, but it also is this safety net for Italian immigrant families who are not necessarily part of the, you know, community. And is that like a good, healthy relationship between the mafia and the immigrants? Probably not. But, you know, maybe if America's police force or America's social systems provided anything for these immigrants, maybe they wouldn't have to rely on the mob. Just saying. Just saying. They... May do with what they had. Exactly. Bruno would be arrested several times throughout his almost 20-year stint as Don, but he avoided any lengthy sentences. And it's not uncommon for people in the mob to spend a little time in jail here and there. That's, you're in the mob, you're going to spend a little time in jail. Some arrests include reckless driving at 16, so before he was really... In the mob, in the you mob. You know, he was 16. We let it pass. We let that one pass. Uh, firearms violations. Operating an illicit alcohol still. Remember, prohibition was a thing around this and time. And you know what? Was young. I'm not going to say yes or no, but like... Mm? Mm? You could be doing worse things. He was fulfilling a need. Fulfilling a need. Illegal gambling. I don't know if he was participating or running. Receiving stolen property. I mean, come on. It's not like he stole it. He might have known it was stolen. Though. You like him a lot, Kelsey. <laughs> listen, listen, my man did nothing wrong. He sounds like he partied, all right? He's just, he's partying. Let him live. 
His longest sentence was two years for refusing to testify before a grand jury because Bruno ain't no narc. He's not a snitch. He knows the number one rule of the mafia. Snitches get stitches. Under his rule, Atlantic City became what we know it to be today, which is this haven of gambling and casinos and hotels because New Jersey's gambling Here laws. Las Vegas. Yeah, it's, it's the East Coast Las Vegas. I think we could say that. Yeah. And, but underneath that, so they're doing a lot of things with gambling and booking and loan sharking, but mobs are not unknown to be involved in the drug trade. And the, this is to say the Philadelphia mob was involved in some drugs, but Bruno forbade family involvement in narcotics. Interesting. At this time, meth and opio opioids were becoming a big thing. He forbade involvement. He was like, we don't need to get in there. He preferred Co Cosa Nostra operations like loan sharking and bookmaking. So Cosa Nostra is the mafia word for what they are. It's our thing mm. in Italian. It's This is our thing. They don't call themselves the mafia. <laughs> He's more interested in the book side of things. The Those are less likely to end in a shootout, I think, is his main motivation for that. Yeah, a loan shark might bust some kneecaps, but, you know, you're less likely to get into some kind of weird street fight or disagreement and that it all ends in a shootout over bookmaking. He allowed other gangs to distribute in Philadelphia for a share of the proceeds. So what that meant was that other mobs and gangs could use the mafia, the Philadelphia mafia's territory to hawk their product. But if they were doing, first of all, they needed express permission. And second of all, they needed to provide a share of their proceeds that was accumulated while on their territory to the family. And they also kind of have their own policing then. So if like someone who's distributing the yeah. territory is fucking up or doing some shady shit, they can kick them out. Yeah, well... At that point, if you are doing, if you're a rival gang and you're doing shady shit on Philadelphia property, as I understand uh, the rules of mafias, you as the don are within your rights to do with that person what you what you yeah. will. We're gonna get a little bit more into the general structure of how the different families interact with one another later because it comes it is important. Yes. But within your own territory as don, you can kind of do what you yeah. want. There's a lot of money in the narcotics industry, and he kind of made enemies in and out of the family for for be, forbidding family involvement, but also like making these people pay him to sell their drugs on his territory. So the so Atlantic City was very much considered Bruno's territory. So technically, this is the Southern Philadelphia Mafia, but Atlantic City is in its own city in New Jersey. So. You know, not technically home turf, but it's considered Bruno's territory by the five families. What are the five families? The five families are the five major Italian-American crime families based in New York. So that's the Bonanno, Colombo, Gambino, remember? We talked about them. Lucci's and Genovese. From 1931 to 1970, the five families for formed into a consortium. Uh, this is an agreement to, and distribution of power of organized crime families over the entirety of the United States. So they determined who whose territory is whose, and they also handled disagreements within interfamily issues. They called this the commission. Because they got their own government thing they're going on yeah. there. So the five leaders of those families formed the commission. So they were the ones you would bring interfamily disagreements to. They were the judges on the panel. Exactly. This was mainly because previous to 1931, there had been a particularly bloody and brutal uh, war between multiple families and in New York. So they decided, we can't be doing this. This is causing, we're getting attention from the police. They're cracking down on us. We, If we organize ourselves and keep our shit tight, like the police will stay out of it. The commission had said, Atlantic City, that's Bruno's territory. And as we said, Atlantic City had become incredibly lucrative after gambling was legalized in New Jersey. But now that meant before when Atlantic City had been given to Bruno, it was kind of a backwater city. No one really cared. Now it's worth something. 
And that's where he shoved that one guy. Exactly. So, and many didn't appreciate what they saw as Bruno's very heavy handed management style of the mob in the area. So there's a little bit of, as we were saying, there's a little bit of internal tension. There's a little bit of external tension because people want to move in in this territory. People within the family want to be making money in the drug trade. It angered a few of the younger members who wanted to share those drug profits and weren't seeing it. But, you know, he's the Don. He can make those decisions. Uh, March 21st, 1980, 69-year-old Angelo Bruno. So he lived... 269. He was Don at the time of his death. He had been Don for over two decades at this point. Damn. He was killed by a shotgun blast to the head while sitting in his car in front of his home. Being in the mob, I'm going to say nine times out of 10, your death's probably going to be pretty brutal. Not that there are still several people who were involved in this and who lived during this time and were in the Cosa Nostra who are still alive to this day, but a lot of them died very brutal deaths. This occurred near the intersection of 10th Street and Snyder Ave in Lower Moya Mensing neighbor in the Lower Moya Mensing neighborhood of Southern Philadelphia. So that's where his, he had a townhouse there. He was sitting in his car with his driver John Stanfa. I don't know why I said his name like that. He was sitting in his car with his driver John Stanfa, who was actually wounded in this attack. We're going to talk there I'm going to say we're going to talk about this person later several times because a lot of these people come back because it's the family. Noted. <laughs> the crime scene photos are ridiculously easy to find online. I think people feel like because it's black and white, they're not as graphic. It's pretty graphic. He was shot in the head. Uh, his face is still mostly intact, but it's a pretty, I think it's a pretty graphic pay photo. So if you want to seek that out, you can. Up to you. I think it's pretty graphic. Yeah, that's a yikes. Yeah, the blast was said to be at point blank range to the back of his head. So what had likely happened is the assailant had come up behind him, either gotten in the back seat and shot or like come up behind the car as it was sitting in the driveway and like shot through the window. Yeah, we kind of see these mafia killings as like very random, very violent, something that happens. The random killing of a Don is actually not something that happens that often. Because you're at the top of the food chain. Exactly. That does not mean it doesn't happen. But it happens... When it happens, some things need to happen first. So these are one of those things where, like I said at the beginning, we don't technically know what happened, and no one officially got punished. But we know what happens, and people were 100% punished for this. Obviously, none of the people involved ever admitted to anything in a per, in an official capacity. What's the first rule of organized crime? Snitches get stitches. But as we will find out, none of them lived very long after this, or most of them didn't. I call this section the three traitors and the invader. Very nice, very nice. Thank you, thank you. We're going to talk about the four people that were involved it is believed, I will say it's technically alleged, but it's pretty obvious, who were involved in the murder of Angela Bruno and why they maybe shouldn't have done this other than murder is wrong. So Anthony Caponegro, a.k.a. Tony Bananas. Tony Bananas! <laughs> Tony Bananas. I really wish I knew some of the, uh, some of the stories behind these nicknames was the consigliere to Bruno. That's a close friend or confidant, basically a right-hand man. The, he knew that the end was coming with racketeering charges about to come down on Bruno. So racketeering is essentially you're involved in uh, labor unions and you're doing something to get a benefit out of that that you really shouldn't be. You're like influencing people in a way that it is illegal. So he may have sought to bring an end to Bruno's reign on his terms, because as consigliere, he would have been one of the people in consideration to take his position. So there was a lot he could benefit from. Exactly. And so he, the idea here is that maybe Tony Bananas wanted to take advantage of the power vacuum on his terms, on his timeline. I wonder if you become the Don, if you can pick a new nickname. I don't know. That might be good. 
Uh, Frank the Barracuda Sindon. That's a good one. That's a good one. And it makes sense because he was involved in loan sharking and barracudas hang out with the sharks. So there's smart. no thought put into these nicknames. He's a smart. He was one of the underlings who was displeased with Bruno's more cautious style of donning. He was a foot soldier of the Bruno crime family and described as Bruno's chief loan shark. Oof. Not a great yeah. chief loan shark. To have. He was considered kind of power hungry, probably wanted more power, and was one of the last people to be made into the family under Bruno. So there is also a question of like, so far we've covered two of these people. One is your right hand man and the other guy is the last guy that you made into the family. So there's a certain question of at 69 years old was Angelo's reading of people maybe becoming a little not as good because clearly the people who are close to you are not trustworthy. And as we know, in the crime family, in the family, loyalty is everything. That was a terrible accent. I'm sorry. Now we have another one. Frank Thierry. That's another Frank. I couldn't find a nickname for him. Uh, he was, but he doesn't need a nickname because he's head of the Genovese crime family in New York City. So he's another Don. So Campernigo was running sports betting in Atlantic City. And as one of the crime families, he wanted a percentage of that. And he did get some, but he wanted a larger percentage of it. Okay. Of that revenue, which, by the way, we're talking about $2 million in revenue here uh, off of illegal sports betting. Yeah, yeah. Small percentage is, goes a long way. Exactly. Bruno disagreed. He thought what Thierry was getting was adequate, and they took the disagreement to the commission, which is interesting because I believe Frank is on the commission, or he's close to the commission as the head of the Genovese family. The commission ended up siding with Bruno that what Thierry was currently making was fine, and Thierry wasn't necessarily pleased with that. Finally, John Simone, the guy whose cousin was roommates with Bruno, also known as Johnny Keys. Johnny Keys! Could not find a whole lot of information on him. There apparently was a Wikipedia page for this guy, but it has since been removed, so I don't know what that, that was about. But other sources tell me he was a captain in the family, of uh, the Bruno family, and he himself, I guess, was Bruno's... Well, I found one source that said he was Bruno's cousin, but then another source said that his John Simone, Johnny Keyes' cousin was roommates with Bruno. But I guess then Bruno would have just been roommates with his cousin because if he was cousins with Bruno, then the cousin of my cousin is my cousin. Confusion. I don't know. This is where family shit gets weird. <laughs> it's confusing. Who is family? I don't know. Many believe that the most likely scenario here is that Anthony Caffinegro, Tony Bananas, and Frank the Barracuda Sindone planned the murder of Angelo with the intention of becoming boss and underboss, respectively. Okay, they both benefit from it. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thierry and Capronegro were apparently friendly, despite the disagreement over the revenue. That's just business, baby. But had uh, had other territorial disputes in the past. So when Capronegro came to him, someone who is either on or close to the commission... With the plan to murder Bruno, Thierry assured Capronigro that he would secure the commission's blessing for a hit on Bruno. Here's the thing about murder in the mafia. On your territory, in your family, you can kind of do what you want, unless it's a dawn. If you get up onto the high levels, okay. you need permission yeah. from the commission because killing a dawn could cause a power vacuum, which could cause a street war, which maybe the commission wants and to And then it fucks them. with them. Exactly. It's now outside of your family and it's everyone else's issue. No prize for guessing what happens here because despite Cap Thierry assuring Capronigo that he would go to secure the blessing, he never went to the commission for this. Bro. So Capronigo, thinking that he had gotten a ble the blessing of the commission because he'd spoken with Thierry, someone on the commission, went back to Philadelphia to put his plan to murder Bruno in motion. However... Didn't get the blessing. So just weeks after Bruno's murder, Capronegro and his cousin were found in the trunks of two cars several miles from each other in the south of Bronx in New York City. Because you fucked with the wrong people. You don't mess with the commission. 
I did find one source that said Cabernet Negro's body was found with several $20 bills stuffed in different orifices. What the f- Because he was greedy. He was greedy. The mafia is nothing if not dramatic. They do symbolism with their murder. Also, the cousin, that might seem a little weird. You're like, oh, why'd you kill the cousin? What'd he do? The cousin, Alfred Salerno, is believed to be the unknown gunman who shot Bruno. Okay, got it. Once again, there is no official record to prove any of these people were involved at all, but I believe it's clear at this point that the commission has done their own investigation and has come to their own conclusions and is now carrying out their justice. To be clear, not necessarily mad about the murder of Adon, more mad that they, no one get, got their permission. You crossed them. Exactly. John Simone would be found dead September 17th, 1980. I found no information about whether or not dollar bills were found anywhere on his person. <laughs> and finally, Frank Sindone, the Barracuda, was found dead in an alley behind a variety store in South Philadelphia, October 29th, 1980. So within the year, all three of these men are dead. I did also find one source that said Frank Sindone was in a bag when they found him, but I, I couldn't confirm that. According to the Philadelphia Daily News article on Sindone's murder, in the months leading up to his death, he, quote, had lost his usual dapper appearance and appeared haunted and hunted. He often neglected to shave and dressed in sloppy clothes, practices he never before had followed, unquote. This is the black spot in Treasure Island. You know that you have been found guilty and you know judgments are coming. And these deaths were widely considered retribution from the commission for the unsanctioned hit on Angelo Bruno. You'll notice one person has been left out from these murders. As the head of the Genovese family, one of the members of co the commission, Thierry was spared from retribution. And I think he fucking knew that when Caffroningo approached him. He's like, I will be fine. Yeah. It's also unclear how much the commission knew about his involvement at the time that retribution was handed out, but it is my belief that he knew that if they were successful in murdering Bruno and he could get rid of three, four birds in one stone, he could get rid of all of his major competition within the Philadelphia family in one swoop. And if his involvement was found out, nothing would really happen. All good for him. Net positive for him. All good for him. Mm. That's how T. Yeri works. And the New York families did end up getting access to Atlantic City, just like Thierry wanted. So the murder of Bruno is considered to be the beginning of the second Philadelphia Mafia War. Uh oh, the gentle dawn is out. The violence will begin. Yeah, this was two decades of relative peace, like to the point that the FBI kind of moved the Philadelphia family to the back burner of their concerns when it came to organized crime because and Bruno had kept such a tight lid on their he business. He kept that shit on lock. Yeah. They were like, we have other families that are, that we should wor be worrying about before them. Like, like that was to the smart. point, like, mm-hmm. And that was exactly his, like, first of all, it's bad for our bottom line to be fighting all the time. Second of all, we were drawing unnecessary attention. But as soon as he was out, Philadelphia crime family went right back to its old ways. This is considered the most the bloodiest time in mob history and is very ironic considering Bruno's nonviolent approach. What followed started out as basically just a war of succession because Bruno is dead. His consigliere is dead. Sindone is dead. Like most of the upper management who there is now no clear line of succession except for Philip Testa, Bruno's former underboss. The only two people who really are considered for boss if the boss steps down and names no, usually the boss will name a successor, but if that doesn't happen, usually it's the underboss or the consigliere, and that's about it. So Philip Testa, with the consigliere gone, it's Philip. So he becomes boss, which lasted less than a year. Ooh, oof, oof, Eight oof. days before the one-year mark of him accepting the boss position, he was killed by a nail bomb placed under his porch. Question, would you ever turn down being the Don? 
Can you? I I don't know if you – I think you can, but if you're underboss, I, I don't know. It's also unclear, like, who's placing him in that position. If, like, right. the commission is, like, you're Don now or if the family itself is, like, you're Don. I think as the underboss, it's understood that you're next in line no matter what happens right. unless you're – Dawn names another successor, which there's not really a huge. Uh, if you're underboss, it's unlikely your Dawn will name somebody yes, else. Got it. Yeah. So Philip is dead. Nick R- Nicodemo, little Nicky Scarfo, remember him? Was little Nicky? Phillip's, little <laughs> Nicky was Testa's consigliere. Oh, this is not going to go well for him, is it? No. So after Testa's death, he left his underboss, Peter Casella, and Nikki, his consigliere, fighting for who would succeed him. Like I said, it's either the underboss or the consigliere. It's usually the underboss, as I understand it, but I think as consigliere, you can kind of make a claim. Especially if I don't believe Testa had specifically named somebody to succeed him because he'd only been a boss for like a year. So he probably didn't think he would have to yet. He didn't get his affairs in order. So little Nicky goes to the Genovese family's consigliere. So little Nicky was consigliere of the Philadelphia family. He goes over the Genovese family, their consigliere, with his suspicions that Casella and a man named Frank Nardu- Narducci, this is like the third Frank, had killed Testa. What's Narducci's nickname? Chicky. Chicky? That's funny. Chicky! We got little Nikki and Chicky! Little Nikki and Chicky. So little Nikki's like, hey, Genevieve's family's consigliere. Casella and Frank Chicky Narducci, they killed Testa. The commission was like, bring him in. We're going to have a good old-fashioned sit-down. And the after a, a bit of an interrogation, I don't think they tortured them. I think they just sat them down and were like, you're in trouble? I don't know. Casella would confess to being involved. They got called to the principal's office. They did. That's essentially what the commission is. It's like, you did crime, but not on our terms. Casella would confess, and Narducci, Chicky, was killed, and Casella was banished from the mob and fled to Florida. I don't know why Casella was not killed. I don't know if it was his position as underboss or... You know, maybe Chick Chicky was more involved, like placed the bomb. The underboss is out. It's just Nikki. So he becomes boss. Little Nikki. And then immediately starts a war. <laughs> now we're gonna get into the Scarfo Ricka Bean war. Or Ricka Bene. I am doing my best with these names. I'm Italian, but not Italian enough, unfortunately. So Harry the Hunchback Ricka Ben thought Scarfo was greedy and unfit to be boss. He refused to pay Scarfo a kick-up tribute. So what a kick-up is, it's very MLM-y. It's you give a part of your illicit profits to the person next up in the command structure than you. MLM, pyramid schemes, the mafia. (laughs) The mafia. (laughs) Hey, girl boss, I want to talk talk to you about this really great opportunity. It's called the Cosa Nostra. Multi-mafia level marketing. MMLM. Bruno had never asked this of Rickaban, so he was like, yo, what the fuck? That's so greedy and shady of you as boss. So Scarfo, again, you can kind of do what you want with your family. So he had three of Rickaban's men killed. And this technically, this is above board as far as the commission is concerned. The commission is like, mm, fine. That's, that's, you know, you handle your shit in your house is the, is the rule here. Rickaban retaliated by killing Scarfo's consigliere, Frank, another Frank, Monty. We need the nickname. So we got Chicky and now we have. I don't think he has a nickname. I don't see one. He's got to have a nickname. He's got to have a nickname. I don't see one. Then he's obviously not actually in the mafia. He's not cool enough. Yeah, I've, I've got nothing for. Frank Monte, so I guess he's the only Frank who stays Frank. He dies he's right the away top in, Frank. This, in this story, so it's not important. Not anymore! He's dead! Well, he was the top Frank. <laughs> he was alpha. Rickaman also had two attempts on his own life during this time, both of which he survived. Rickaveen's men, the ones that he had sent to kill 
Frank Monty were actually caught by police. Because there are police in the story. Oh my god, police are actually there? <laughs> exactly. Uh, they confessed that Rickabin ordered the murder, which is a no-no in the police, or not in the police, <laughs> in the mafia. You don't, you don't squeal, but they did. Apparently, not that loyal. They confessed that Rickabin had ordered the murder, and then he was convicted and sent to prison, which put an end to the scarfo rickabin war, and left Scarfo the undisputed boss. For now. Scarfo! So, like I said, sometimes, like, it's not unheard of for Don's or underbosses or pretty much anyone in the mafia to spend a little bit of time in jail but if you're in for murder you're in for a while true and it's like "Mm, you can't do too much while you're in there you can you probably have connections you can do some things but yeah i don't doubt that rick bean's time in jail was relatively comfortable due to his position but still oh like you see all of those like old like they have a sofa and a table for writing and a lamp and a rug. Like, they're decked out in there. Now that Scarfo's in charge. And remember, Bruno initially banished him to Atlantic City because Scarfo was too much of a hothead, was too violent, was too, you know, un- unpredictable. Now he's like, we're going to get into the meth industry. <laughs> Bruno from wherever he's looking out on is like, everything that I worked on, everything that I worked on, crumble. Actually, I feel it's important. The same article that was talking about Frank Sinzone's death, like, mentions Bruno's murder because, like, it's relevant. And they were talking about, uh, I believe it was Sindone, who he would not be buried on church ground because his marriage wasn't considered legitimate in the eyes of the church. A whole thing in and of itself. I'm not really sure what that was about. But in that article, Somebody else asked about Bruno, I guess, because it was they were all relevant. It was all the same people. And the church apparently ruled on it and said his, you know, his afterlife affairs were like, I believe the quote was well in order. I don't know what that means. He, it means he had at some point made his peace. <laughs> no, I think it means he bribed the church, but, you know. That's what I mean. I see. I see. So as boss, Nikki was seen as ruthless and paranoid and would order people killed with any sign of disrespect. Very different from Bruno's style. No more gentle dawn anymore. No. Eventually, Scarfa would be sent to prison on RICO charges. So he was boss for about four years before he got taken down on RICO charges. This about Around this time, uh, the FBI was really cracking down on organized crime. So this was not unique to the Philadelphia Mafia a lot. This was the time where all the Mafia families' wings were essentially really clipped. The yeah. FBI was like, you're done. So we had... you done. We had Bruno, who was like two decades. Then we had... I can't remember the guy that was after him for like one year. Testa lasted a year. And then... And then it was Nikki. Testa, you did... Blue Nikki for four about so it's been like five years nobody has yeah and i will say uh angela bruno's stint as dawn is a bit of an outlier in terms of length even for other families but most of them last a little longer than a year (laughs) so who would actually be sent to prison for 45 years for a 45 year sentence for rico charges and what that is is the racketeer influenced and corrupt organizations act Turns out it is illegal to be in the mob. Who would have thought? Specifically, Scarfo's charges included racketeering, 10 murders, 5 attempted murders, extortion, gambling, and narcotics trafficking. Bro. To be clear, I don't think I gave a good explanation of what racketeering is. For those who don't know, uh, racketeering is the act of acquiring a business through illegal activity operating a business with illegally derived income and using a business to commit illegal acts. So whenever you hear people talk about a front business for a mob, that's what racketeering is, essentially. Got it. It's a laundry man. Exactly. There's also also more specifically labor racketeering, which is the infiltration and or control of a union or employee benefit plan for personal benefit through illegal, violent, or fraudulent means. That's pretty common for organized crime. Because I think that's kind of where it started. 
because our organized crime and immigrants and blue collar workers and protests those going to go hand in hand in a lot of ways in this country because for a long time like that was the way that you got a voice as an Im Italian immigrant or a Chinese immigrant or any other kind of immigrant was you banded together and you made your opinions known and that kind and then they realized oh hey we can do this for other things we can police ourselves since the police won't do it and then suddenly it's oh we can make we have power when we come together we have power when we come together the police don't police they don't help us so why should we follow the rules why don't we make money for our community our way and then it just kind of evolved from there so in some ways racism made the mob actually in all ways i'll say that <laughs> that is the summary of kelsey's essay in conclusion racism made the mob so Scarfo goes to jail and Anthony Piccolo takes over. Scarfo still kind of tries to remain in charge from prison for a few years. But that doesn't last super long. The uh, We saw with Rickaban, Rickaban wasn't a boss, so the rules were a little different for him. But also, it's, it's hard to stay boss in prison when you're going to be in prison for 45 years. I think they were hoping to get him out earlier. Didn't happen. We're looking at a major crackdown on the FBI on organized crime. So like the influence of the mafia as a whole, the Cosa Nostra is rapidly decreasing. So we're seeing that event. And also within the mafia, it's starting to splinter. There's not as much of control. There's definitely, there's an old versus new at this point. So the newer people, they are unhappy with a lot of the traditional ways of the older people who are within the family, but you know, it, there's very much a deep-seated tradition within the Cosa Nostra. There's definitely an, a respect of elders in there. So while the younger people are displeased with it, the system is not willing to change, even though at, these young people are seeing this huge FBI crackdown. They're like, hey, we need to change our ways or we're not going to survive. But the old people are willing to go down with the ship. They're like adapt, adapted order to survive and they want to keep the tradition. Yeah, okay. Exactly. That seems very much like how it usually exactly. goes. <laughs> Even organized crime is not immune to the old versus the new. So at this point, there's kind of a splintering of specifically in the Philadelphia mob. They're called the Young Turks, which is just, I don't know why they went with that. I don't, choice. So they kind of become their own splinter off. So the controlled power of the mob is very quickly splintering under in its own on its own and also cracking down under the FBI. So today, a lot of these families still exist and they are still, I'm sure they would deny doing crime, but you know, to each their own. I will say they are still in business, but the, the might that they once held is no longer there. And I would also say like the need is not there as much anymore. Like Italian immigrants don't face the same level of discrimination they don't say face the same level of like working conditions like there's not the same need for it so i think the the very base of it was kind of lost so people didn't feel the need to join the mafia so like it all comes down to recruiting numbers it loses its power then like you they needed this in their community yeah. so they, it had to be built and so they were filling a gap and then that gave them more power but if you don't need that anymore people don't have to go into business with you. Exactly. Anymore. And I think also like, to be honest, I think a lot of the families kind of got away from their roots in a lot of ways. Because we, we saw with this labor racketeering, like they started to take advantage of the systems that they helped set up for their, like it, you kind of lost your own base. So their own morals, they kind yeah. of skewed. So eventually Piccolo would step down because he wasn't really in charge. I don't want to like say that like, come on, Anthony, you weren't really in charge. He was in charge. He was boss. But really, he was kind of just doing whatever Scarfo from prison wanted. Eventually, he would step down. And who would take his place? John Stanfa. John Stanfa. Who was in the car when Angelo Bruno was murdered. It all comes back around. Damn. And I don't, you could maybe make the argument that like, because, you know, he was never like, he was in the car you know it's a lot of his testimony who's to say he didn't 
have a hand in it. I'm not saying he did or did not. I'm saying there's no way to know. But that would be a long Could walk a, around to get to that point. It's a long game. I don't think so, but you never know. It is interesting that after all that, he gets to be boss. And this is where we're going to end because the second mafia, the second Philadelphia mob war continues after this. Like it remains to be a very bloody time. It's mostly wrapping up at that point when Stanfa takes over, but there are still there are still assassination attempts and a lot of street violence. But again, because of that street violence, actually, it was its own undoing because that's what the reason that the FBI started to crack down. You'll remember we were talking about well, Angela was in charge. He kind of made the FBI put his family on the back burner because he was like, oh, we, you know, we take care of our own. We got it. You know, you don't have to worry about that without us. But also he was going to be going to jail for racketeering charges too. So maybe it was inevitable. Wait, do we know what kind of, uh, you said it goes back to another mafia war, but how was this guy at being the top dog? Oh, he was, um, I believe he was Piccolo's consigliere. But how was he as a Don? Oh, how was he as a Don? <clears throat> Uh, well, he continued the war and I attempted to assassinate somebody else. So, you know, I, was gonna say, I assume it's not good because they go into war, but. Oh, I see your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, uh, John Stanford kind of continued the uh, tradition of violence at that point. He didn't like try to go back to. So Giovanni John Stanford kind of continued the cycle of violence. Kind of continued I would what say. Piccolo That's was doing, of... which was continuing what he had done. Yeah, okay. Exactly. I was like, I know we got to war, but I just wanted to know if there was any shift in what they were doing. Business. Well, I guess uh, when John took over, the Young Turks went into open rebellion mm -hmm. at that point. I don't know if it was a specifically him thing or it was the time and place. Enough time had passed. It just kind of happened at that point. So the war absolutely continues. But if we keep going, we're going to just keep going until modern yeah, day I got you, I got because you. it kind of just keeps going i would say the the golden age of the mafia kind of at least in philadelphia kind of died with bruno yeah yeah okay because then the young turks start rebelling re start a rebellion the fbi is cracking down the philadelphia mafia is still alive and well but it is nowhere near what it was at the time Bruno was alive. And I honestly, I think he would kind of be disappointed at what happened because I think he really saw it as a business and saw it, you know, I don't want to say he like, he put a he lot put of work, a lot into, of work it. into being like, we're going to communicate, we're going to mediate, we're going to like not mess within the family. And, and it immediately it went like back that. to that the second he was dead. Back to Moda. And it's like, yeah. He was considered a pillar of his community. And, um, you know, we've talked about, like, I feel I do feel the mafia kind of got away from its roots. I don't know how much of that happened under Bruno. As far as Dons go, he was a pretty good Don. But it's also important to remember, he was the head of an organized crime family. He was still a Don. He definitely was still a Don. Had a, had a heavy hand in a lot of different crimes. And I do not doubt ordered at least a few murders in his time. Despite being the gentle Don, he was not afraid to use violence when it was important, when it was relevant. Because it's still the mafia. Because that's the thing. You can be the gentle Don. And I think that's part of what ended up getting him killed in his later years is that he was considered the gentle Don for much of his career. But as he got older, he seemed more and more reticent to use that force. Mm -hmm. And I think people saw that as a weakness. And that is what ended up causing his murder, I think, is that people decided to take advantage of a weakness. And what's interesting about this is that uh, the gang war may have not happened if Thierry had just gone to the commission. We don't know if they would have given the blessing for the assassination or not. Hard to say. Anyway, that's where we end here. Uh, pushing your chairs. We're in a nice Italian restaurant in a casino. You know, there's like a group of men in like a back room drinking wine, smoking cigars. I don't know what they're talking about. But, you know, it's not our business. It's not our business. It's none of your business. <laughs> I didn't see nothing. I didn't hear nothing. I don't know shit. Because <laughs> snitches get stitches. Well, I'm excited for Kelsey to do another episode on maybe the New York Mafia. We'll see. I'm ready for her Mafia era. <laughs> <laughs> 
Don't tempt me. I could get in it. Listen, if I'm doing four parts on the Texas Killing Fields, you could do multiple parts on the Mafia. I could. I could. It's just the mob. Listen, I like. I ended in a kind of a weird spot because I was like, we could keep going, but if we keep going, this is going to be forever. Maybe I will do a part two when we talk about the end of the murder. Or not the murder. Uh, the end of the war. Because the, <laughs> the second Mafia War is not the only war. All right. Well, we got to stop for today, but... Thanks, Kelsey, and thank you guys for joining us. Thank you. Don't get involved with organized crime. Uh, crime doesn't pay. Stay safe out there, guys. Bye. Bye.